Hi, thanks for joining us on demand today. I'm so honored that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. If you are new or just haven't had a chance to connect with any of us yet, go ahead and text welcome to the number on your screen. We would love to get to know you. We'll send you a little gift and just see how you can be a part of Gold Creek. What I love so much about Gold Creek is that we have things going on all week long, whether you're online or in person. We've got connect groups all throughout the week. You can join us in the chat on Sunday. We've got on demand throughout the week and plenty of other opportunities for you to join us. If you are ready to take that next step and see where you fit in, go ahead and text connect to the number on your screen. We would love to get you plugged in. I believe you have taken this time to come listen to the message that we've prepared for you. God has something special for you in this message. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get on into it. My wife and I were getting ready for a trip. Now, really, I was getting ready for a trip, but it, it was my wife and I getting ready for a trip because I had the bag. I was packing the bag. I was going to be going for two or three days away, and, and um, she was coaching me. Um, I've kind of gotten used to a little more coaching these days. And uh, so she's coaching me on how to get ready for this trip, and we were packing this bag and asking me all these questions and and being a little intense about it. And, and I was thinking to myself, there's, uh, occasionally I pack for myself and I have no help whatsoever. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I was thinking, man, I'm, I just turned 65 the other day. And I was thinking, I think I can do this by myself now. I think I'm, I got this. I got this. So I'm packing this bag and Coaching's coming along, and it's a little heavier and heavier, and, and something snapped in me. It doesn't ever happen to you. I'm sure it never happens to you. And I just turned to her, and, and maybe it was my tone. Maybe it was the snarl on my face, but I said, quit mothering me. And, and, and those words got out there, and it started a kind of a little fight that lasted for a series of time. And in, in our household, the fight goes like this. She goes quiet, and I go crazy. I don't know what your fights are like, but I get to start this series, and it's so fun for me to be here to start this series on fighting words. I love it, because I love a good fight. Do you guys like a good fight? I, I love, man, if I can be around, if I can watch your kids, especially brothers and sisters, I'll needle them a little bit, get them into a fight, and just watch it happen. It's so on. You know, put two little kids in a room and give them one toy just to see how it's going to work out. It's so fun to see fights. I love it. And I, I am so honored to be asked here by Pastor Nick. And I'm telling you, Pastor Nick's done it. Oh, what an incredible pastor you have. What a great church you have. What I'm so proud of what God's doing here. I'm so proud of what God, what God, how God's using Pastor Nick and Carissa. And, and I am excited to be here to talk about some fighting words. So here's what I want to do. Since I like to fight, I want to watch you guys fight a little bit. So uh, pick somebody in the room that you can fight with. Usually it's someone sitting next to you. If you're brothers and sisters, good time to just go at it. Mo moms and dads, you know, whoever, husbands, wives, friends. I don't care who you are. I just want you to fight. I did some research and there are seven or six or seven phrases that are the most common phrases that cause fights. 
So here's what I want you to do. I want you to practice and get into a fight this morning. It's your permission to just go at it. So here's a phrase. Turn to your, to your neighbor, whoever this person you're going to fight with. I want you to turn to them and say this. You always blame everything on me. Okay? Just try that out. You always blame everything on me. Anyone said that? Isn't that a great word? That's a great one to get a fight going, man. If you need some sparks in your relationship, just try that one out. It'll work really good. How about this one? Now, this one is one of my favorite. Get ready. You're, here's what I want you to say to your neighbor right now. It says, you are just like your mother or father. Fill in their name. Just. Oh, you know that causes a fight, don't you? Wow, some of you have actually said that, and we're sorry you said that. Some of you are thinking that and would never say that, and I just got you to say it, and you didn't even know that you got a chance to say it. Or how about this one? Turn to your neighbor and say this phrase, you, no, you are wrong. Here we go. No, you are wrong. That's right. <laughs> Always works. Here's another one. This is a surprising one. Some of you are going to say, I didn't know this causes a fight. Here's what happens. Somebody gets a little elevated in their emotions. Somebody's a little more emotional. Usually one of the two of you is a little more emotional. And the emotions are up there and they're starting to rise up. And the person who thinks themselves to be in control uses these words. Turn to your neighbor and just say these words. Calm down, would you? <laughs> That always works. Boom! The explosion goes off in the room, right? That's, uh, those are fighting words. How about this one? Here, turn to your neighbor and say this. You're just too sensitive. Come on, you're just too sensitive. If you really want to start a fight, it doesn't matter what. Just start your sentence with this word. Oh, maybe, I'll tell you what, guess what word it is. Do you know what, what do you think what word would it be? Here's the word you start your sentence with, why. When you start the sentence with why, you know that that person's going to be defensive. And that means you're in a fighting posture. Now, I want to say all that to say that we are starting this whole series about figuring out how to deal with fights. So the big idea today is I want to teach you how to tame your tongue. And can we all agree that we need to tame our tongue? We're going to learn this from a guy that had to learn how to tame his tongue. His name was James. James was the brother of Jesus. If you were to look at Jesus' siblings, he had a number of siblings. He actually had brothers and sisters, the Bible says. The next in line to Jesus was James. So think of being the second child to Jesus. James said some things as he wishes he hadn't said. But amazingly, James was this guy that became a follower of Jesus and was stoned by the Pharisees in Jerusalem because of his following of Jesus. And so James has all the credentials to teach us how to tame our tongue because he had to learn it himself. And here's where we're going to start. In James chapter 3, verse 1, it starts this way. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now he's talking to himself because here's James, brother of Jesus, that became actually the leader of the church of Jerusalem. And what he was saying is it's hard. It's hard to be a pastor. It's hard to be a teacher. It's hard to be a leader. It's hard to be a parent. Hard to be a boss. Why? Because there's a standard that you're going to be judged a little higher than everyone else. So here's the first thought. To tame the tongue, we need to know that we're going to be held accountable for what we say. Once we recognize that, it's really important that God's going to hold us accountable and that there's a different standard for the way that we talk. My grandson's in um, uh, internship in another church and in uh, Texas, a great church there, a church in Granbury, and good friends with the pastor. And, and I've been working all 
all year long with him on his internship. He's spoken a number of times. And I've got to coach him. What a privilege. It's so much fun to do. And he's now got to the end. Two weeks ago, he ended his internship. And he had four choices. One of the four choices was to become a youth pastor. And I, I, Audrey and I, my wife and I, when we think about that, it troubles our soul. We just say, if you can do anything else but pastoring, do it. Because it's hard. And we, we said, hey, listen, we'll pray with you. We prayed and fasted one meal a day for a week to just to think about it. And the, the reason, as, as I talk about it today, is because I, I was preparing for this message and I got to that verse that said, we're going to be held to a higher standard. And I was saying, and I shared that verse with Tristan and say, if you choose this way, it's, it's a, a pathway that's a more difficult pathway. And just be ready for it. You're going to be judged more strictly. How about you? Are you a parent today? Are you a leader today? Are you a boss Every one of us that have people underneath us, because of our tongue, we're going to be held accountable for what, what, what we say, and we are going to have to learn how to use our tongue in a positive way. And here's why. Here's why. James chapter 3, verse 2 says this, indeed, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Jesus' brother is actually saying this, which is kind of fun because Jesus was the perfect child and James clearly was not the perfect child. He's the second child. Jesus is the son of God. James is not. And I, I think it would probably bother James to always have this perfect kid. Oh, yeah, mom, she's your favorite. The perfect kid. You can imagine what James said. It's not a surprise to me that when you read the, the Gospels, there's a time in the Gospels where James, who took over the carpenter shop when Jesus left the carpenter shop, he took over the carpenter shop and James collected his brothers and sisters and his mom and went to collect Jesus to bring him back to the carpenter shop. And James had a message for Jesus. You're crazy, dude. What are you doing? That was his message. There's another passage where he actually was, get, Jesus was getting ready to go to Jerusalem and, and James was needling him a little bit, if you're really the son of God. He was a pure skeptic. James was this guy that said to Jesus, you're not all that. And there's a moment when the Bible says that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He showed up to all his disciples, and the Bible says, and to James, his brother. Can you imagine when James met Jesus and he said, I was wrong, wasn't I? I wish I hadn't said those things. So let me ask you a question. When's the last time you made a mistake with your words? And when did you say, I was wrong? Think about it. If you're having trouble, ask your partner, your neighbor, somebody to think about it with you. They'll help you. Ask your kids, what would they say? Ask your spouse, what would they say? If you're worried about, if they won't tell you anything, your coworkers will. If, if they won't, I will. Come to me, I'll tell you something. James gets really honest now. He says, we're not perfect. We're all not perfect. So, and he goes on in verse two, he says this, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So here's the, here's the point. You aren't perfect because you have a tongue. Think about that. We have to, in order to tame the tongue, we have to recognize the power of our tongue. What did, same, what did someone say in your life that still affects you to this day? Think about that. 
Think of something positive that someone said. I can remember a college kid coming to me, and there was a high school group I was a part of, and he looked at me. He was going to college. He was going off to college, and he said to me, he says, Dan, I think you can lead this Bible study. I had never considered leading a Bible study, and all of a sudden, I was a Bible study leader because he said, I think you can do it. At the same time, I remember another guy who looked me in the eye and pointed his finger at me, and he said, you're never going to amount to anything. I never forget those words. How about you? Have some words of somebody in your life really affected you? Words have incredible power. And because we have a tongue, we're not perfect, and we've got to be careful with our words. James 3.3, he goes on to describe it this way. He says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want to by means of a small bit in its mouth. So he uses this illustration. He says, here's this horse, and, and because of this horse, we put a bit in its mouth, and it, you can control it to go any way you want to. Now, this is a bridle. It doesn't have a bit in it. A lot of people are no longer putting bits in the horse's mouth, but the truth is that the bit in the horse's mouth gives you way more control over a horse. That started in Kazakhstan, if you wanted to know, if you were interested, at three or four hundred years before the time of Christ, the Kazakhstanis decided to try and control their horse by putting a bit in between the molars and control the gum. And because of that, they started uh, what they called the, the first weapon of mass destruction was a horse controlled by a bit, which means power under control. I learned about that. It's the power to control. By the way, there's, there's blanks. There's a sheet. You can fill in blanks. I'm actually trying to give you some of the answers to your blanks. Uh, but there's a, I learned about that bit, right, in the horse's mouth uh, one day when my brother took me on a long, and it was my first time on a very long 18-mile backpacking trip. And I had my uh, first experience uh, leading a horse, and, and I had a pack horse that I was pulling behind me, and I had a green horse because he thought I was green. I should have a green horse. You know how that goes. My good brother. Uh, so I'm on a green horse pulling another horse, and, and we're on our way back, and there's a steep, steep trail, dangerous trail, one that I was incredibly nervous about. And he put me in front of the pack train because he said, your horse is the slowest. It'll slow all the rest of the horses down. So I led, the, and I'm leading this pack horse, and I'm going down the trail. And as we go around one of the 90-degree trails, it had just a bit more room without realizing it. All of a sudden, my pack horse passed me. And now the pack horse, which is very interested in the hay in the, in the trailer that he knows is in the trailer, starts running down the trail. And my brother looks at me and said, Dan, you have to stop that horse or it's going to die. Because he knew that that horse and its load was going to throw the horse off this steep trail and that horse would die. He says, you have to force your horse to cut through the 90 degree. You have to go straight down. Just lean back. So like a man from Snowy River, I pulled that horse over and I leaned back and down we went. And I cut off that horse. You know what I had to do? I had to make that horse go where it didn't want to go to save the other horse's life. Think about that. Our tongue has the power to control positively. Parents. Your tongue has such a power in your kid's life. Use it in a positive way that saves their life. Lead. Take control. Recognize how powerful your tongue can be and can help your kids. In the people in your life, God has put these people underneath you. You're held to a higher standard, not just for what you say, but what you don't say. God wants us to 
take them where they don't want to go. You've heard the terms, chomping at the bit, right? Chomping at the bit is a horse that is impatient and a bridle that's holding it back. So here's a question for you. What did someone say to you that really changed your life? Leaders and teachers and parents say those things. I can remember a college professor saying to me, Dan, I, re- I turned in this paper and he said, Dan, you can do better than that. And I knew this guy. I liked this guy. And he was right. I could do better. And you know what? I, I did better. And it was, his words helped me. It was painful at the moment, but it was helpful for me. I can remember my dad saying to me when I wanted to quit and the practices were hard and it was a sport that I didn't want to just keep going back to, he says, Kellogg's don't quit. Those words were painful, but they helped direct my life. Parents, leaders, teachers, use the words that God has given you to powerfully direct. James goes on and says this, a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. It was the Chinese that invented the the center line rudder, by the way. That center line rudder has the ability to turn the huge ship, and it's still used to this day. What is that? That's the power to direct. What did God do? Use somebody in your life. Who did God use in your life that directed you? I can remember telling my son, you're never going to go to college. And then he went to college. I, I learned he was rebellious. So if you told him the opposite of what he should do, then that's what he would do. That's a great method for you. Uh, it's awesome. It's uh, exciting. Okay. So, I, I mean, when somebody said, you can't do that. Or then they say, you have what it takes. I can remember as as a 12-year-old, a pastor who said to me, when I knelt at the altar and I said, I think I want to be a pastor, he said, you can do that. Not only you can do that, but you should do that. And at 12 years of age, I never wavered from that. I knew God had wanted me to be a pastor. His words helped set the direction, the course of my life. Choose your words. Not only for yourself, but for the other people in your life. James goes on, verse 5. In the same way, the tongue's a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. So what do we think about the tongue? Is the power to control, the power to direct. It has the power to set fires. What did somebody say to you that set you on fire? Here's, I, I got some words for you to think about. Somebody that said to you, let's get married. Wow, that set you on fire. That's a cool fire, right? But think about those same words in a different way. I want a divorce. Somebody that just says, man, you are amazing. You are an amazing person. And it just sets you on fire. Someone else that says, you're no good. You're beautiful. You're ugly. Man, you look like you're in shape. You're fat. I talked to one guy this morning. I said, what did he say to you? And he says, said I was skinny. You can see all these words. You're, you're honest. You're a liar. All these powerful words. It has the ability to set fires in your life. And there's a positive way we can set our kids on fire, the people in our life, in a positive way. And James is saying to you, your tongue has that power. But now he gets into the heart of the matter. In verse 6, for among all of the parts of the body, the tongue is the flame of fire. It's the whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. 
for it is set on fire by hell itself. Here's the problem. Our tongue has a potential for evil. And our tongue has the potential to hurt us the most. You see, to tame our tongue, we have to recognize its potential to be misused. Our tongue can kill reputation. It can kill ideas. It can kill ambition. It can kill dreams. I don't know how to illustrate that better than this. I just want you to think about this here for a moment here. When you go light somebody up, which is kind of interesting. So, for example, right there, I feel really bad about this. Jim, I'm so sorry I got you wet. You guys, Ofa, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And, and your mom, I, I mean, she's, she can't see me even, and she got wet. And I'm so sorry that I got you wet. I'll tell you what, I'll take it all back. It's impossible, isn't it? You really got wet, didn't you, Jim? Oh, that was good. That was awesome. I almost did you, Dom. I know there's someone, there's someone over here. Anyway, so... In the same way, you guys, when we start to spew our words, once they're out, they can't be taken back. James illustrated it. He said this, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but nobody can tame the tongue. It's restless, evil, and it's full of poison. Watch out for the poison. This poison, it's poison, has the power when we ingest those words and take them in to kill. It kills our ambitions. It kills our dreams. It kills our hopes. Sometimes it kills our future. I pray today that somebody else's words have not become poison to you. James goes on to say this. Sometimes it praises the Lord and the Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and curses come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, brothers and sisters, this isn't right. Here's the, here's the warning. You've got to watch out for the hypocrite. The hypocrite is the one that says they are one thing and they're really not. Here's a question. Just honestly get ready. I want everyone to answer this question. I want you to answer it honestly by raising your hand. Here's what I want you to do. Raise your hand if you've ever been burned by a hypocrite. Have you guys ever been burned by a hypocrite? Look around this room. Oh, a lot of you have experienced what I have where somebody isn't what they said. But you got to be careful because all of us have a little hypocrisy in all of us, too. I hate it when someone says to me, oh, I don't go to church anymore because of all the hypocrites. It kind of makes me laugh because if I think about it, that makes them one of the biggest hypocrites because they're going to stay away from the, the thing that God chose to change the world and they claim to be a Christian, but they're unwilling to participate in the very thing that God, as imperfect as it is, it's the thing that God chose to change the world. Watch out for hypocrisy. James goes on to say this. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? These are rhetorical questions. Of course not. Does a fig tree produce olives? No. Or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't dress fr take fresh water from salty spring. It's all about the source. And we need a new source. To tame the tongue, we need a new source. The words that fill our mouth... The words that come into our life need to come from a different place. And James, as he finishes out chapter 3, actually begins to show us where that place is. 
In verse 17, he says this, but the wisdom from above, there's the key. God's wisdom is first gentle and it's pure, it's peace-loving and gentle at all times, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. It fills your life with his wisdom. That's what we need to do is fill our lives with his wisdom. And then he says this, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. The challenge is for us today to plant seeds with the wisdom that comes from God through our tongue. So it's time to plant some seeds. Would you bow your heads? I want to plant some seeds in your life. You're here today and you may need a horse's bit, a, a, a bit of directing of your strength. Your strength is a bit out of control. I want you to hear Jesus' words. I want to plant a seed in your heart. Listen to Jesus' words. If any of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If anyone you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for the sake of the good news, you will save it. With your heads bowed, just maybe today you need a, a bit of direction like a ship. You need a rudder. Listen to Jesus' words. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he'll give you everything you need. There's some direction. Or maybe you need some antidote for some poison, some poisonous words that have come into your life. I want you to hear this. Paul said this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of you need a fire extinguisher. There's a negative fire that's been lit in your life. Listen to his words, Jesus' words. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for, the great, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. One last thing. James said, no one can tame the tongue. But here's what Jesus said. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, all things possible. Now open your hands on your lap. Admit today the imperfections of your tongue. Just admit it. Tell God what you've messed up. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to fill your mind and your heart with his wisdom. Now, Lord, help us. Help us to plant the seeds that you have in mind for us to plant. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Such powerful words. I think every one of us in this room can can say that we've either been the one that's received negative words or we've been the one who's given them. I love that last verse there, where everything is possible with God leading us. Everything. Here in a moment, we're gonna close out our service, and and during this time, we're gonna have a worship song, and during that song, we just invite you to to stand there and worship. Maybe you wanna go to the crosses, pray. Maybe you just wanna pray in your seat as you're standing there, wherever it may be, just that you can allow God to speak with you, and if you just need to let go of something during this time, that this is the time you can do that. So will you join me as we stand and we worship this one last song, and after the song, you'll be dismissed. So have a great week.
this out. Just a word. Just one word. You come to store that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Just one touch. I feel the presence of heaven. One touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word. Broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive it a dream. And just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can help. Come on, sit down. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. God bless you, Gold Creek. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys next week. You're more than welcome to stay and worship with us if you'd like. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Oh